Okay, so time for a new subject. Let's introduce the subject and pose the questions that we're going to try to answer. And the, I feel that with identical particles, there's lots to think about. And um, it makes it uh, into an interesting way to conclude the course. So identical particles. So there is the issue of defining what do you mean by identical particles, and then the issue of treating them. So what are, when do we say that two particles are identical? We say two particles are identical if all their intrinsic properties, like mass, spin, charge, magnetic moment, if all these things are the same, these two particles, we have particle one and particle two, are said to be identical. For example, all electrons are said to be identical. And if you think about it, it's, well, what does that mean? You can have an electron moving with some velocity and an electron standing here. And they don't look identical. They have different states. Well, they're identical in the sense that what we said, the intrinsic properties are the same. They, those two particles have the same mass. They have the same spin in principle. They have the same charge, have the same magnetic moment, have all the same properties. But they can be in different states. One electron can be in one momentum state, an electron can be in another momentum state. One electron can be in a spin state, spin up. This can be in spin down. But uh, what we would mean is that if you would put, by saying these particles are identical, we also mean they're indistinguishable. What that would mean is that if one of you gives me an electron with spin up, with some momentum state, and, uh, and uh, yeah, let's say spin up and some momentum state. And another one of you gives me another electron with same spin up, same momentum state, and I have those two electrons, and I play with them for a minute, uh, and I give them back to you, you have no way of telling you got the same electron or you got your friend's electron. There's no possible experiment that can tell which electron you got. So when we have identical particles, like electrons, elementary particles, uh, we understand what it means to be identical. It doesn't mean they're in the same state. It means that this is a particle that uh, in all the properties intrinsic of them are the same. If you have a more complicated particle, you still can use the concept of identical particles. So for example, you have a proton. A proton is a more complicated particle. It has, it's made of quarks. And if you have two protons, they are identical in that same sense. All the properties we can give to the proton, the spin state of the proton, mass of the proton, the dipole moment of a proton, the magnetic moment of a proton, all those are the same. If you prepare those protons in identical states, I cannot tell which is proton one and which is proton two. Then, uh, you have the neutrons. Neutrons is the same thing. You have the neutrons can be in several states, but two neutrons are considered to be identical. We can complicate matters uh, more. We can say hydrogen atoms. Are hydrogen atoms identical particles? And in quantum mechanics, we can think of them 
as identical particles or identical atoms or identical molecules. Or if you write a wave function for a hydrogen atom, a new kind of entity of particle, we will use the axioms of identical particles even for the hydrogen atom. But you could say, oh, no, but they're not identical. A hydrogen atom can be in the ground state or can be in an excited state. But that's the same as saying this electron is going with little momentum and this is with high momentum. These are states of the hydrogen atom. Just like an electron has spin up and spin down, hydrogen atom has this state, that state, that state. If you arrange them in the same state, you cannot tell they're different. So, however clear these comments can seem or confusing, perhaps, uh, Things can be a little subtle. In many ways, for example, physicists used to think of protons and neutrons as identical particles, as a, the same particle. So what? Uh, well, that's the way they thought about it. Um, it's a very nice uh, thing. If you're working with energy scales, that the proton and neutron mass difference is not that big first of all. So at some scale for the resolution of some experiments or physicists that didn't have that many tools, the proton and the neutron were almost identical and people invented uh, this term called isospin. And you might have heard of it. It's a very famous symmetry of the strong interactions. In fact, for the strong interactions, you have a nucleus, whether you're proton or neutron doesn't make that much difference. So people used to think of a part of this thing as an isospin state. Just a spin one half, you have spin up, spin down. Isospin means spin in some new direction that is kind of unimaginable, but the isospin up would be the proton, the isospin down would be the neutron, and you have a doublet. So people used to think of these two particles as different states of a nucleon, and then they would say, all nucleons are identical. What do you complain? A proton is the same as a neutron. It's just a different state of the isospin, just like a spin electron up, a spin down is the same. So uh, the power of the formalism in quantum mechanics is that it allows you to treat these things as identical particles. And this makes sense. If for you, for your experiments, these are identical things that you can think of different states of that, you, you may as well treat them that way. So this is uh, basically um, what happens. Now, uh, so we define the identical particles. I didn't write anything here. Uh, I'm going to get notes out uh, today uh, on scattering and some of these things as well. So in classical mechanics, classical mechanics, Identical particles, particles are distinguishable. And that's the main thing. How are they distinguishable? Well, uh, you have two particles and uh, I can follow whenever they're moving, I can say, okay, this is particle one, this is particle two. With quantum mechanics, you can do the same thing when they are really far away, those particles, and they don't come close together. Uh, there's some sense in which classical mechanics sometimes applies, uh, and that's when they're far away. Now, when the particles in quantum mechanics get close to each other, then you lose track which one is which. They occupy the same position. But in classical mechanics, they are distinguishable because you can follow their trajectories. Trajectories. Which is very nice. You have an experiment, you follow the particle and say, oh, this is particle one, this is particle two. They're here together, they're going around, and they, they split. You follow the trajectories from the beginning to the end. 
In quantum mechanics, there's no such thing as the trajectories. There's these waves, the waves mix together, they do things, then they separate out, and you just can't tell what they do. There's another technique that we use in, uh, in classical physics that it's probably also relevant. We can tag the particles. particles. That means if you're doing an experiment with billiard balls colliding, you could take a little marker and put a red dot on one of them and a black dot on the other one. And that tagging doesn't affect the collisions. And you can tell at the end where is the red ball and which is the black ball. We kind of do the same in quantum mechanics. There's no way anyone has figured out of tagging a particle without changing drastically the way um, the interactions happen. So uh, it's a nice option in classical physics, but doesn't work uh, in quantum mechanics. Even in classical physics, we have something that um, survives. If you have a Hamiltonian for identical particles, R2, P2, that Hamiltonian is symmetric under the exchange. Whatever the formula is, it's not changed if you put R2, P2, and R1, P1. It's a symmetric thing. The Hamiltonians have that symmetry. And um, there's no way to do this. So let's, uh, let's get to the bottom, the real problem with identical particles with quantum mechanics. Uh, there's, uh, we cannot tag them. Once these particles get together, you don't know what they did. You do an experiment of scattering in classical mechanics, and uh, you put two particles coming in, two detectors, and uh, you tag the particles, and you see what they do. You do it in quantum mechanics, and you don't know if particle one did that and particle two did this, or if particle one did that and particle two did that. It's just not possible to tell. It just uh, they're very different. So how do we deal with, with this? Well, that's the subject of what we're going to do. But let's just conclude today by stating the problem. So the problem is that when we had distinguishable particles in quantum mechanics, we used a tensor product to describe a state. So for distinguishable particles, distinguishable particles, say 1 up to n, we would use the tensor product and write psi i1 for the particle 1, psi i2 for the particle 2, psi i n for the particle n. And this says particle 1 is in the state psi i1, particle 2 is in the state psi i2, psi i n. And these states are one of many states, for example. That's all good. And this is for distinguishable particles. And uh, that's all correct. Now, suppose you have two electrons, one up and one down. If they are indistinguishable, how are we supposed to write the state of the two electrons or two spin one half particles, or maybe in some cases, maybe some other particles? Am I supposed to write that the first particle is in state up and the second is in state down? Or am I supposed to write that the first particle is in state down 
and the second particle is in state up. How do I describe the state? With this one or with this one? They look equally plausible. So if you were in charge of inventing quantum mechanics, one possibility that it may occur to you is that if the particles are defined to be identical, then those two states should be identical. They should be undistinguishable, identical, physically equivalent, and uh, this might be a good hypothesis to consider. Unfortunately, that does not work. You would say, why not? It seems so logical. I cannot tell the difference between these two. Can I say that they're equivalent? Well, no. If they would be equivalent, if equivalent, equivalent, you could form a state psi alpha beta, which is alpha times the first plus minus plus beta times the second minus plus. And I'm not going to write all the subscripts nor the tensor sometimes. With alpha and beta having this for normalization. That's a normalized state. Now, uh, if all those are equivalent, if those two are equivalent, all these are equivalent for all values in alpha and beta, because the superposition of equivalent state is an equivalent state. But then let's ask for what is the probability that we find the two particles in the state psi 0, which is plus along the x direction, times plus along the x direction. You know, whatever I do, uh, whether this hypothesis there that those two states are equivalent is correct, a state that is plus and plus uh, is, can only be described one way, plus, plus. So I ask, what is the probability that this state psi alpha beta is in the plus along x and in the plus along x? Now, you remember those pluses are states like plus, plus, minus, tensor, plus, plus, minus, with a 1 over square root of 2, and that becomes this. So this is 1 half of plus, 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 minus, plus, minus, plus, plus minus minus, that's the state. So what is the probability that psi alpha beta is found in the state psi zero? It's this number. Now if you do the inner product of these two vectors, only the mixed ones go with each other. And this gives you one half of alpha plus beta squared. And one half of alpha plus beta squared is the inner product of these two states. And now you see that it depends on the values of alpha and beta, because this is, in fact, one half of alpha squared plus beta squared plus two real of alpha beta star. And since alpha and beta are normalized, this is one half of one, or this is one half plus real of alpha beta star. So this hypothesis that these two states are equivalent would mean that these states are equivalent for all alpha and beta that are normalized. And then you would have that the probability to be found in psi zero would depend on what values of alpha and beta you choose. So it's a contradiction. So we cannot solve the problem of the degeneracy of identical particles by declaring that all these states are the same. So we have to find a different way to do it. And that's what we will do next time.